Hear the word of God. Then the Pharisees met together to find a way to trap Jesus in his words. They sent their disciples along with the supporters of Herod to him. Teacher, they said, we know that you are genuine and that you teach God's way as it really is. We know that you are not swayed by people's opinions because you don't show favoritism. So tell us, what do you think? Does the law allow people to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Knowing their evil motives, Jesus replied, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used to pay the tax. And they brought him a denarian. Whose image and inscription is this? He asked. Caesar's, they replied. Then he said, Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and give to God what belongs to God. When they heard this, they were astonished, and they departed. Let us bow in prayer. Come, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire, and lighten us with your celestial fire. For if you are with us, then nothing else matters. And if you are not with us, then nothing else matters. Be with us, we pray. In the name of your beloved. Amen. The question comes up in almost every confirmation class. What about evolution? And I say, what about evolution? Knowing perfectly well what they're asking, but asking them to be more clear. And they say, well, it, we learn about evolution in school and, and like Darwin and, and all the evolution stuff and we learn about God and creation in the Bible. Which is it? And I say, both. They don't like that answer. And then I describe what I mean. Science describes the how, and the Bible describes the who. I believe that God is the creator of the universe, I say, and that is my statement of faith. I also believe that Charles Darwin helps us have a better understanding of how things evolve. And countless scientists have helped us better understand things through the theories that they have about how creation works. Just as you believe that 1 plus 1 equals 2, and it's good for every complete sentence to have a subject and a predicate, both can be true. God can both be creator of the universe and the Big Bang can explain how our solar system came to be. For many of us, uh, the conflict between science and creation is a non-issue. But I still find that people are shocked to learn that my husband is a scientist and a Christian and he finds that the science that he learns on a daily basis, learning more and more about creation, makes him more and more in awe of God. He believes that the scientific advancement actually affirms the amazing nature of God's creation. In 2015, a Pew Research Center performed a survey that found a majority of people believe in evolution, though a little over a third of older adults still believe that human beings didn't evolve but were created in their present form by God some 10,000 years ago. Several years ago, our society was gifted with something called the St. John's Bible. The first handwritten rendering of the Bible since the invention of the printing press. I was one of the many skeptics who thought, who needs a handwritten Bible? I would go write some fancy font on a computer and we'll be fine. But once I saw some of the pages on display at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, I changed my tune. The beautifully illustrated Bible was a labor of love, written by six calligraphers, illuminated with 160 pictures, taking 12 years to produce. One of the more interesting facts that I learned was about the writers. They were, they were writing the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. They were copying the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. And they sometimes, in their copying, as is true of anybody who copies, they made mistakes, sometimes skipped a line, sometimes skipped an entire verse. 
And if they had progressed far enough that they, they couldn't erase the mistake by scratching off a layer of the vellum or the calf skin on which they were writing this, they would write the missing verse at the bottom of the page and draw a line to where it was supposed to go. And this one has a, has a bird pulling that verse, that line, up to the right spot. I learned that to write the St. John's Bible, the writers used materials including eggs, uh, feathers for the quills, and hand-pounded ink to write this hand-printed Bible in as, as, as genuine a way and as similar a way to what was used before the printing press. Now, after I learned about the primitive materials and the mistakes that the scribes made creating St. John's Bible, was I less impressed by the beauty of that Bible? No. I was even more amazed by the hard work and dedication that it took these women and men to create this over the span of 12 years. What dedication it took to make something like this happen. In a similar way, our understanding of creation as expanded by science doesn't in any way diminish the awe we have for our creator. In the creation story, God wants to show us God's presence, that there is one who created everything and that everything that is created is a reflection of God's glory. God claimed everything and called it good. You, as a creation of God, have sacred worth because you are a creation of God. You are created in the image of God. Science can't teach us about the meaning of life or its goodness. Science cannot teach us why all of this was created. There is plenty of room in our lives for both science and faith. We're not committed currently in a political campaign season. Oh, look, Jeremy's running for office. <laughs> Strong, modest, intelligent, trustworthy, hardworking. I think that fits him very well. We're not running a political campaign right now, but we just did go through a season of midterm elections where it seemed like every commercial on TV, on the radio, on the internet was a political ad. I once asked in a Bible study I was leading a few years back what their favorite part of the election was because there was that same kind of grumbling going on during that election season about all those political ads and all those things that they're saying about the other candidate. And <clears throat> so I thought I'd say, you know, oh, what do you like about the election campaign? A few mentioned their interest in the debates that the candidates held. A few more spoke of their pride of having the right as a citizen to cast their vote on election day. But the majority there at my Bible study, about a dozen women, said their favorite part of the election season was the day after the election, when there was peace and quiet. It's a shame that we no longer engage one another in respectful, faithful conversations about politics. We have opinions about what's going on in the political world, and we all have the ability to converse with those with whom we disagree for the purpose of building understanding and community. You understand that it is so very rare, in fact, I've never seen it happen, where I have opinion A and you have opinion Z, and we argue about it, and, and you become all the way up to A and say, oh, you are so right. I've been thinking Z for the last 20 years, and now I think A. That's not why we have political conversations. We have political uh, conversations, so you better understand me, and I better understand you, and we build community, right? If I'm afraid to talk to you about certain things, how can I fully trust you? How can I fully engage with you? And so to trust one another and understand that we're not necessarily, well, there's no way we're talking to convince, we're talking to create community and understanding. As I said last week, one of the best ways we can connect with each other is through our stories and how we got to the point where we are politically. 
but most of us choose to avoid religion and politics and conversations. I wonder if the, one of the reasons we don't engage in political conversations is that our governmental leaders often make disagreements and not merely disagreements. Uh, not, they often make disagreements, not merely disagreements. At least those that you see broadcast on television because they're sensational, right? So the sensational, outspoken, uh, unusual polit politicians make disagreements, not merely disagreements, but op opportunities to disrespect and insult those who are on the other side. A few years ago, I read a book by Parker Palmer called Healing the Heart of Democracy. He wrote it hoping to once again make government of the people, by the people, and for the people actually that. He wrote about reclaiming the government as we the people and no longer surrendering our political conversations to the people in Washington. In this book, he writes about a conversation he had with a New York City cabbie when uh, he asked the cabbie how he liked his, his job driving this cab in New York City. And the driver said, well, you never know who's going to get in the cab. So it's a little dangerous. But you meet a lot of people. You get to know the public, which teaches you a lot in life. It's like going to school. If you only like one kind of people, yet that's not good. We talk. And if I have a better idea, I tell them. Maybe they say yes, maybe no. That's how I educate myself. You can't buy this kind of education. If you're with the same kind of people all the time, it's like wearing the same suit all the time. You get sick of it. But the public, it keeps you alive. This cab driver had captured the joy of democracy that many of us have lost or have never had. Not only have we incorporated into our mentality from childhood a fear of the stranger, we have expanded that fear to include any ideas that are strange to us. Many of us like to interact primarily with those with whom we agree. The fear for some is that we will lose any kind of relationship with those with whom we disagree if we get too controversial. If we stick our necks out too far, we fear that someone will take offense or leave the relationship, and so we continue to smooth over our differences and try to create the appearance of unity so as to not rock the boat. But in my experience, I have found that when people talk to one another with respect, we find our horizons expanded. We find community strengthened when we engage each other with respect. Members of the congregation are more compassionate towards those with whom we may disagree when we've spent time engaging in conversation with them, building community with them, building understanding with them. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, once wrote uh, a sermon. He did not believe that you should squelch diversity but embrace it. And in one sermon, he wrote over and over again, if your heart is as my heart, give me your hand. And then later in this same sermon, though we cannot think alike, may we not love alike. He knew that in any democracy, there'd always be disagreement, but that the church could find its unity and its love for God and its love for humanity. As John Wesley liked to say, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. Jesus isn't a Democrat or a Republican. Jesus isn't Methodist or Catholic. Jesus isn't pro-life or pro-choice. Jesus is pro-love. Part of the bane and blessing of the richness and depth of our faith is that we can hold a variety of political opinions and positions that align with our understanding of what Jesus would have us do. In today's Bible reading, the Pharisees challenged uh, Jesus, the Pharisees and the Herodians, the teachers of the law and those who claimed allegiance to King Herod, and they sought to trap Jesus with a political question. This encounter, which turned out to be during the last week of Jesus' life, <clears throat> was evidence that the church leaders were getting uncomfortable. They sought to trap him in order to have an excuse to get rid of him. They said, is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? In 
and occupied Israel, taxes the Israelites paid directly to the Romans, uh, financed the Roman occupation of their land. So they were paying to their captors. The Pharisees and Herodians knew that if Jesus answered no, it's not lawful to pay taxes, the Romans could arrest him then and there for encouraging people to disobey the law. And if Jesus answered yes, it is lawful to pay taxes, he would lose much of his following because the Israelites believed that a Messiah was here to come and overthrow the Roman government, not have anything to do with the Roman government and banish those awful taxes they had to pay. Jesus' answer, as you remember, was to see a coin, a denarian, and ask whose image and inscription was written on the coin, and they said, Caesar. So he said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. What are we to give God? In Genesis 1, we read, God created humankind in God's image. They were created in the image of God. Male and female, God created them. So give to Caesar what is Caesar's, the coin on which Caesar's image is stamped. But give to God what is made in the image of God. That is us. Male and female, we are created in the image of God. On us, God's image is stamped. And we belong entirely to God. Christians need not fear evolution or politics, rather embrace the world and its expanding knowledge so we can increase our knowledge and increase our faith. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Read that with me, would you? In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Let us pray. Holy God, we love you, we worship you, we give thanks for you. Thank you for giving us the minds and the knowledge and the understanding that you are in all and with all. Give us courage to enter into conversations, respectful conversations with those with whom we may disagree for the sake of building community. Give us a heart that is at peace with yours and may your blessing rest upon us. Amen.